Thank you. Uh, I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And welcome everyone uh, to uh, the Wheeler Centre uh, for this very special event with Philippine Secretary of National Defence, Gilberto Teodoro Jr. I'm Justin Bassey. I'm the head of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, I'm biased, I know, but uh, the region's leading defence and security think tank, which is why it is a pleasure for ASPE to host what should be an excellent discussion on defence and how national security and regional affairs can have global impact. And of course, we're here on Remembrance Day. So I'd like to take this opportunity to recognise all of the men and women who have shown great courage in the face of great danger and remember all those who have sacrificed, sacrificed so much so that we can live in freedom. Unfortunately, despite all those generations who have shown such courage to fight for our freedoms, that fight is a never ending process. And nowhere is that more relevant than the Philippines right now, who have not only been standing up for their own sovereignty, but for all of us in the region, which is why the Philippines deserves all of our support and solidarity. So that is my great pleasure to welcome Defence Secretary Teodoro. Gilberto Teodoro is the Philippines Secretary of the Department of National Defence. He is the Principal Assistant and Advisor to the President on Defence Matters, and he exercises overall authority, direction and control over the Department of National Defence Offices and its bureaus. And he's very experienced in the role, having first served as Defence Secretary from 2007 to 2009. He's consistently pursued the strengthening of bilateral and multilateral security and defence cooperation, which of course is needed now more than ever. And prior to joining the Department of National Defence, Secretary Teodoro served as a member of the Philippines House of Representatives from 1998 to 2007. So he really is an esteemed guest who we, whom we are so pleased to host here at ASPE's first, but certainly not last, defence and security session in Melbourne. Not much more from me, we want to get straight into it, so I will hand uh, over to the Secretary uh, and to ASPE senior analyst, author and defence expert, Dr Ewan Graham, who will be leading this evening's conversation. I'm really very certain that you'll enjoy the conversation and I know that Ewan will try to leave a few minutes for questions from the audience. So as you're listening, uh, think about those questions, have them ready, uh, but for now, over to the Secretary Diodoro and Ewan. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Justin. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Secretary Tayodoro, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here, uh, as Justin said, to uh, our first event uh, down here in, in Melbourne, but very much with our eyes uh, on Southeast Asia and, and the bigger picture uh, with you here today. Um, Secretary Tayodoro has kindly agreed to have a conversation and then there'll be uh, time for some questions uh, from the audience afterwards. So. Uh, without further ado, um, let's get straight into it. Uh, this is um, actually your, your second time in the job as uh, uh, Secretary of Defence. Uh, with that in mind, I just wondered if you'd care to share with us uh, your impressions coming back, how they differed from when you were back in the job under President Arroyo more than a, a decade ago. Uh, what were the differences that you noticed um, a lot has happened internally in the Philippines, uh, the Duterte administration domestically, uh, and of course the external security situation has developed a great deal since then. How has that influenced your thinking this time round about your priorities for the job? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ewan. Thank you, Justin, for the kind introduction and a meaningful uh, uh, Remembrance Day to each and every one. Uh, during the time of President Arroyo, uh, the uh, greatest threat uh, being faced by the Department of National Defense at that time was internal security. There was a separatist uh, movement, uh, raging insurgency, and uh, the uh, external threat portion of the defense mix wasn't that pronounced, although we, we were seeing some signs of uh, uh, eventual expansionism by China at the time, which is why the bilateral strategic dialogue between uh, the Philippines and the United States was uh, 
uh, was born between Secretary Robert Gates and myself. Uh, then, uh, come 15 years later, a lot has happened. There was a resurgence of uh, Chinese expansionism, wolf, uh, wolf warrior diplomats, aggression in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea, uh, the uh, war in Ukraine happened, uh, Middle Eastern issues also happened. Uh, mind you, during the Arroyo uh, administration, this was at a time when the OIC, uh, the Organization of Islamic uh, Conference, was very, very powerful and had a profound influence in uh, uh, the Philippine security environment because of their influence on the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and other separatist groups. Uh, and our need for oil. Uh, since the Arab Spring and the implosion of several uh, uh, regimes in the Middle East, uh, the new threat now that we are facing is the expansionism uh, of China or by China in the West Philippine Sea. It's uh, United Front Works activities. Uh, meddling in internal affairs of uh, the Philippines on the economic, the social, and the political fronts. Uh, world uh, conflicts worldwide, which affect each and every country because of tightening supply chains and uh, threats to uh, our nationals uh, wherever they may be. Uh, in the Middle East, for example, we have millions of Filipinos our uh, seafarers have been held hostage by the Houthis. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Europe, for example, uh, it, it tightens our supply chains. And here in the Indo-Pacific, we know the threat. It's China. It is the greatest threat to regional peace and stability because of its uh, illegal illegal activities under a false narrative of uh, an, an, a 10 dash line, simply put. Let, let's relate that um, set of challenges specifically to the armed forces of the Philippines and mm. uh, its ongoing modernization. Yes. Uh, that's been a work in progress uh, over um, uh, several decades, uh, but it's noticeable that there's been a recent uh, shift if you like to sharpen the teeth of the, a, of the AFP's capabilities, uh, new aircraft that have been bought, new surface ships uh, across the board, um, but also including missiles that have been acquired from India, and indeed just very recently reported your comments about the interest in acquiring the US uh, Typhon system as well. Um, that is a very different set of uh, uh, yes. capabilities to those that you referred to being primarily internal security focused. Uh, are you happy with the pace of modernization uh, and um, uh, the backing that the, uh, the president, President Marcos, has given to you uh, in terms of the resources that will be allocated to defense as a national endeavor? Okay. Uh I, I don't think you will find any uh, defense secretary or minister that will be happy with the pace of uh, capability uh, uh, enhancements that the department needs. However, uh, I, for, I cannot really be happy because we should have done it years back. Uh, we experimented in alternative dispute resolution mechanisms for our internal and our external defense. And it hasn't worked. I mean, fine if you have international structures that seek to maintain peace and stability, but you will always have rogues. You will have always have people who will not follow norms that are laid down. And normally, these people had massive governments and massive resource, with massive resources and with the ability to influence change, to change the international order to their own, uh, to their own uh, way of 
viewing things or controlling things. That being said, our uh, transition to external defense has uh, brought on a lot of challenges. And coming from the private sector, I looked at first the systems in place. And that is from a department level, in a, firstly in the structure of your uh, uh, planning mechanism on the department side, your uh, governance mechanism on the department side, and you cascade it down. When we cascade it down, we have to have new skill sets uh, from the uh, members of our armed forces. We have to think out of the box on institutional and, uh, uh, shall we say, well thought of grounds though, and not just ad hoc, uh, which has also affected our previous modernizations. So uh, thirdly, we have uh, to invest also in the infrastructure for basing uh, the uh, notion of joint commercial and military bases uh, perhaps will not work with our need for operational security because of our capability mix that we seek to acquire. Firstly, we need to invest in command and control and domain awareness. Mm -hmm. Since uh, we introduced the comprehensive archipelagic defense concept, where our domain uh, of operations, area of operations, is increased vastly to uh, our exclusive economic zone and other areas where we have the jurisdiction to include our con extended continental shelves. Uh, on a 360 degree uh, basis already from our archipelagic baselines. And secondly, we are investing in deterrence. I, I mean, that, that's the best way to guarantee our security. Uh, and uh, thirdly, we're uh, we are investing in reach. Now, having said that we are investing, it is my problem now and in my uh, obligation now to look for the funding. Uh, and uh, as, as we know, uh, the Philippines Particular, at, particularly now where it has faced successive typhoons and will continue to face until the first quarter of next year, devastating typhoons which eat a lot out of our budgetary reserves. Uh, secondly, where we are also investing in resilient infrastructure. Uh, we are heavily spending on social amelioration mechanisms like conditional cash transfers, uh, uh, health uh, programs, and the like, we have to look for creative uh, uh, forms of raising cash to finance our defense budget. So recently, and it's also a bonus of having been part of the banking sector in the past, I have talked to uh, our local bankers. Who, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of liquidity in the system and since our mission area is not internal security anymore, but territorial defense, there is no ESG problem with raising uh, money from the financial system for investing in external defense. Because the main mission area right now is upholding of international law norms, in UNCLOS in particular, and with the uh, primary clientele of commercial activities that properly redound uh, to the Republic of the Philippines under international law and under our constitution that we can fully ex explore, exploit, and use all the resources within our territory and with whom we do uh, business with with whom we do our joint exploration with should be solely at the discretion of the Philippines, Philippine nationals, and the government without a bear hug by an unwanted neighbor that wants to appropriate everything for itself, selfishly at that. 
I think much of what you have said will resonate with an Australian audience, despite the differences in strategic circumstances. One of the things we have in common, of course, is, is a common ally, the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and something that's also evident from the outside is that things have happened quite quickly uh, in, the, in terms of reviving uh, the uh, US-Philippine uh, alliance. Um, just like to ask you a, a bit more about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Specifically, what's your timeline uh, for the implementation of the uh, Enhanced Defence Cooperation Agreement, EDCA, yeah. uh, and the um, facilities that were um, identified back in 2015. I think they've been right. expanded uh, since then. Uh, and um, as a writer to that question, of course, when the United States looks at the Philippines, it sees not just a loyal friend, but also an important strategic location, uh, not just with the South China Sea in mind, uh, but Taiwan, to your north, and I'd just be interested in your reflections from a Philippines defense perspective. How much does Taiwan intrude on your thinking when you're developing uh, defense policy and, and, and strategic policy? Uh, uh, on the part, uh, I, I'd say some, some portion of it goes in, in terms of the safety of areas in the Philippines in case of a conflict, but more importantly, the Philippine nationals in Taiwan. What do we do with them? How do we extricate them? And how do we bring them back? But what we're seeing in the Philippines now is that Taiwan, as a point of friction between China and us, is inexistent because China's point of friction with us and with all of us is the South China Sea and its illegal intrusion into the areas which are properly are under the jurisdiction of the Republic of the Philippines. So we don't need a Taiwan issue to have uh, uh, resilience against an, interlo uh, 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 an interloper, which is China. So uh, China has made our strategic uh, nece uh, necessities quite clear because of its actions. I have been asked uh, what will change our, our calculus? What will change our bilateral or multilateral cooperation? China decides to pack up and go out of the West Philippine Sea, it will change my calculation tomorrow. So, so the, the, uh, Taiwan in so far as we are concerned, because of what China is doing to us and the reasons for it, it, it need not be part of the calculus. And EDCA? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have nine identified sites, but let's uh, make the process, uh, I'd like to clarify the process. These are Philippine bases which we need to uh, develop on our own with a few portions of these sites that are reserved for the United States for logistical purposes. Uh, there, are, there are an additional five with an initial four. Out of the five, we want to do those as quickly as possible because we also need to develop these bases for our own use. And some of these bases, uh, have uh, some legal issues that I will have to deal with. Uh, and once those are settled, then we can go full blast on, on, on a side-by-side on a -side basis. Particularly now where we need uh, the assistance of the United States uh, in resilience for, and in uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster response. Uh, it takes time for them to mobilize uh, assets to, to help us with rescue and relief. So uh, having facilities where they can pro preposition uh, not only goods but capabilities on, on a rotational basis would help a lot. Let's, um, you've already mentioned the South China Sea, let's take our, our focus um, down more narrowly there. Uh, the situation at the second Thomas Shoal got a lot of attention. I think a lot of Australians were all also aware of the tensions uh, that were flaring there, including uh, physical harassment of resupply missions, uh, including armed forces um, personnel, which is 
obviously a grave situation in its own right, added to the fact that the United States has a treaty obligation to the Philippines. So that was being watched very closely. It seems that the tensions have somewhat abated, uh, and we assume that's in part because of the bilateral agreement that the Philippines reached with China, specific to the conditions around Second Thomas Shoal. Uh, can you assure us that the agreement that was reached uh, did not compromise sovereign, uh, sovereignty at the expense of safety? Uh, and does it lay the foundation for a continuing presence of the uh, Philippines military at Second Thomas Shoal into the future? Okay. Let me answer the second portion first. Uh, I think the President has made it clear that our presence in Second Thomas Shoal is, uh, is, is uh, it's immutable in so far as we're concerned. It's, we have a right to be there and no agreement can fritter away our right to be there. The arrangement made with China was a Department of Foreign Affairs arrangement which uh, I wasn't, uh, uh, actually, uh, I, I have not seen the agreement, and we work with the Department of Foreign Affairs to carry that out. But then again, having said that there is a bit of an abatement of friction, of tension in the Second Thomas Shoal, there is tension in other areas like the Scarborough Shoal, and, and some areas like uh, in Escoda, what, what do you call Sabina. it? Sabina. Sabina, Sabina Shoal. Uh, so, I mean, uh, China's just, you know, uh, having an, a, a modus vivendi perhaps on one area. And so that, then again, uh, I, I, I'm really, uh, I, my job really is whether or not there is uh, some sort of uh, an abatement or a, an easing of uh, friction. My job is to deter uh, further, uh, you know, incursions by China, and our, my job right now is to build up the defense establishment as quickly as possible that, that's on, very... on solid foundational grounds uh, and not on an ad hoc uh, basis. That's clear. You, you mentioned um, Sabina Shoal. Um, another way in which the Philippines, I think, has uh, got a lot of attention uh, is on the um, so-called transparency campaign mm -hmm. that has been uh, followed in the South yeah. China Sea to raise awareness, name and shame, if you like, China's ac activities, um, uh, coercive and aggressive as they are. That, to my understanding, has been mainly associated with the Philippine Coast Guard uh, where does it feature in defense priorities, if at all? Uh, and could you say, um, given that the president has recently initiated more coordinating mechanisms on the maritime side, how is that bedding in? Are you finding that the concerted approach uh, between different arms of the Philippines government is, is coming together uh, in the South China Sea in a, in a positive way? I believe so. I believe so, under the stewardship of the Executive Secretary in the National Maritime Council, there is really a primus inter pares, uh, the Executive Secretary being the highest in the cabinet, uh, uh, stewarding the, a coordinated approach towards uh, the West Philippine Sea area. Uh, now, the Transparency Initiative uh, was merely an initiative out of a principle which we hold high. It's really transparency because what we are doing in the West Philippine Sea and what gains us support from the world community is the uh, uh, adhering to international law standards and norms. And once we, free, we, we, we veer away from uh, transparency, good governance, uh, upholding of generally accepted principles of international law, the UN Charter, and try to uh, uh, unilaterally do things which are contrary to the letter and the spirit of these laws, then we lose. We, we lose credibility in the world. We, 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 we will not gain the support that we have been getting from the world because then uh, we, we will be as credible as China is. 
uh, which uh, you, you have your opinions on how credible they are, and I have mine. Uh, let's take our focus up um, to Southeast Asia. Uh, you mentioned the fact that the Philippines has received international support. I think that's certainly true from Australia, uh, from Japan, yes. from the other US, from the United States and the other allies. It, as an observer, it's less clear, frankly, from ASEAN that the mm -hmm. Philippines has received the kind of diplomatic and other forms mm -hmm. of support to which it might feel entitled in its hour of, of need uh, from its fellow members. So could I just ask you candidly, do you, is that a fair assessment? Uh, and um, how do you propose to, at an individual bilateral or trilateral, however you want to cut the cake level with your fellow ASEAN members, uh, with a particular focus perhaps on Vietnam because of the similarity of its maritime situation, and Indonesia because it has a new president and Indonesia um, sets, I think, the pathway for, for much of what is done within, within ASEAN? Yes, I, I think that's a fair a uh, fair statement to make because it is what it is. Uh, there has been no uh, ASEAN position on Chinese aggression in, uh, in the South China Sea. And several of us uh, have been victims of this already, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia recently, where we, if what appears in the media is true about these diplomatic notes and the challenges of the Chinese Coast Guard. Uh, so I, I think I will just quote uh, uh, our president in the ASEAN summit where he stated that we cannot close our eyes to what is happening in the South China Sea. So uh, in uh, conversations with my counterparts, I feel on the defense side there is some consensus on, though, uh, on uh, those uh, defense ministers I have talked to about some ASEAN position uh, of working together towards an ASEAN position on the West Philippine Sea. I think the focus now is on the, the, the code of conduct. Uh, uh, my own view is that we should continue to talk uh, about it. Our diplomats should, but on what basis that, that I need to see. Because how, for, for me, simply put, Will a code of conduct mean a status quo? And if it's a status quo that is a condition precedent to that, then China has already an unfair advantage in so far as we are concerned, even though it steps back halfway of its incursion into the EZ of the Philippines, then they're still at the winning edge. So, uh, and, and will it, uh, will the code of conduct be uh, supersede uh, unclosed requirements, or will it be uh, relegating a problem to oblivion where future generations will have to fight over it without any clear path uh, to, to some solution? Will it be a continuation of discussions and consultations, that favorite word of uh, Chinese diplomats, which means relegated into uh, the, you know, in, into the oblivion, grass. yeah, uh, rather than a settlement or a negotiation. I think it's extremely irresponsible and it shows a disregard of uh, international order and a disregard of the, uh, of what you want to leave behind to future generations if one waffles from, uh, uh, getting a problem settled, a problem of this magnitude, which the world worries about. I mean, the conflict area was extremely small, a shoal, but it resonated world, uh, worldwide. It, 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 uh, it engendered a lot of concern. And for a country to say, let us discuss and consult and not solve it, is highly irresponsible. I think you make a, a powerful point, um, if I can paraphrase what you said, that uh, uh, to have a poor uh, code of conduct may be worse than, than no co code of conduct at all. Definitely, that is my personal opinion. I just trust that our uh, the, the, the very experienced diplomats on ASEAN side 
will we'll get a, a powerful one. And I'm sure that they will not bargain away their individual and collective interests. And it's, um, I think, relevant in that concept that the Philippines has its turn at the chair not too far away. In fact, the, the after Malaysia, uh, which was the year designated supposedly for the agreement of a code of conduct. So that's, that's one that I think foreign affairs as well as defense will be uh, keenly watching. Um, this is your first visit to um, Australia. Um, so it would obviously um, be misplaced not to think about the bilateral relationship and the Philippines uh, defense cooperation with Australia. Perhaps we can turn to that now. Uh, and um, what are your thoughts for Australia's role uh, in the South China Sea? How can Australia assist the Philippines in these other tasks that we've talked about in arms forces modernization terms? Uh, is there anything that we're not doing at the moment that you think we should do or things that we could do more? Well, I think that Australia plays a vital role in maintaining peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And if we consider the South China Sea as the aorta of the Indo-Pacific, then Australia, in concert with other uh, like-minded uh, countries, has a vital role to play in upholding the freedom of navigation, adherence to international law of all parties uh, in, in that vital aorta, that vital artery of the, the Indo-Pacific. Likewise, like the Philippines, Australia straddles both the uh, South China Sea side and the Pacific side, of which we all have an interest in uh, maintaining peace and stability because uh, we know that China is trying to extend its reach and its influence uh, in, in a very realistic, ma in, a, in, a, in a very realistic uh, manner in the Pacific, which also, you know, it worries us too. Mm. Uh, then, that being said, I think Australia's contribution to mi uh, minilateral uh, institutions that seek to and maintain peace and stability are very significant, like the squad. And uh, we hope that the squad evolves into something uh, that is uh, more meaningful, more powerful, and uh, as a matter of fact, we have agreed to inaugurate the uh, coordinating center in Manila soon. Could you perhaps explain the composition of the squad? For, oh, for the, the squad is composed of the United States, the Philippines, Australia, and Japan. Uh, this is an uh, agreement of four uh, defense establishments to work together in maintaining uh, uh, regional peace and stability. And uh, we've had uh, two uh, uh, meetings so far, and we've agreed on a lot of minilateral activities. Uh, of course, the easiest to pull together are the uh, maritime cooperative activities in the uh, West Philippine Sea. However, there will be uh, more coordination and cooperation on that basis. Uh, and with Australia, we, we are in a closer position because of the fact that we have a status of visiting forces agreement, which uh, we are very thankful for. And uh, we, we also thank Australia for hosting uh, a lot of multilateral exercises like Pitch Black, which we joined and uh, we will continue to join. Now, uh, we, uh, there is momentum on the cooperation minilaterally between Australia, the Philippines, the United States, Japan, and of course, uh, uh, synergy between South Korea, uh, Singapore, and uh, uh, New Zealand, of course, Canada, uh, which the Philippines seeks to have uh, a visiting forces agreement soon. Uh, and uh, New Zealand too, uh, on, on, on this side of the world. 
So I, I, I feel that with uh, Australian leadership, uh, other, uh, other important participants uh, who are similarly situated and who may be similarly situated can join together. I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this was born perhaps out of necessity, as I said, because of China's actions. However, it should be institutionalized because these actions of China were born out of autocracy. And these are the outliers that a, an ideal world order fails to capture or fails to envision but we need to react and be very realistic in managing by deterring these kinds of, we cannot interfere in the internal systems of these countries. So we have to accept the fact that uh, people with strong ambitions which may violate our rights as countries will crop up and the way that uh, the responsible way of dealing with these kinds of situations is to steal up ourselves individually and collectively in order to protect our citizens from the ravages that may be wrought by the ambitions or desires of these people. I think that's, that's but responsible and that's what's required of us as democratically elected as, as par parts of democratically elected administrations who are responsible, who are transparent, and, and who, who uh, have a, a, a role to play in, in the values that we, we cherish. It's a persuasive message, and it's one that um, uh, I'm sure you will take on your travels to Canberra tomorrow, and I, I hope you get a receptive uh, audience there, uh, Mr. Secretary. You've given us so much to think about already. Uh, I think the warm, the, the room, uh, I, as far as I can take the audience temperature, we are truly warmed up and I don't want to deny your uh, uh, opportunity to ask questions. So um, with your permission, we'll now move to the question and answer component of our discussion. Uh, could you please um, raise your hand or otherwise indicate if you would like to uh, ask a question, identify um, who you are. Please keep it to one question only and keep it as brief and follow um, the Secretary's uh, bold, bold example of uh, being concise. Uh, I saw the gentleman in the, with the red, red type next to Rowan. Uh, yeah. Oh, Mike. Yeah, okay, my colleague, Mike, Mike Coppage. Hi, I'm Mike Kopich. I'm a uh, lead ASPE's uh, Climate and Security Policy Center. Um, you mentioned that disaster response and resilience is expensive but important, uh, particularly after typhoons, which set, look set to worsen under climate change, uh, along with sea level rise. We know that building resilience to climate needs many partners given the costs involved. I'm curious what argument you'd make to the incoming U.S. administration about the importance of maintaining investments in this space for the region's security. Well, I, I believe that even in the United States, I, I think with the recent uh, cycl hurricanes in the East Coast that ravaged the state of Florida itself, I think the need to uh, invest in resilience and to co-partner with other nations in investing in resilience is obvious. However, uh, leadership in this area by those who can afford, I, I don't want to pull the, the trump card of moral responsibility, but I will um, the, <laughs> in, on behalf of my country, because we are a net carbon uh, emitter, net zero carbon emitter. Uh, whether or not we have clean air in our country will still be ravaged because of China and India spewing out everything. And so what we need to invest in really is first in response and secondly in habitability and safety of habitation. Uh, thirdly, of course, to make the Philippines more competitive and this can be a, 
a measure of partnership between like-minded nations. It's on uh, connectivity and infrastructure, uh, resilient infrastructure. A lot of uh, uh, the roads, for example, in the Philippines, uh, which evolved in, uh, which developed into major road networks were there to service uh, vulnerable areas because these were areas where commodities were shipped out of. These are flood prone areas or mining areas. And so the roads were built on fault lines. Communities were built in vulnerable areas right beside rivers which flood or in mine sites or in, in agricultural areas where they should not be. So it will take a lot of investments to re relocate communities, or if we cannot relocate them, make them more resilient, and to build the right infrastructure in the right areas so uh, we do not suffer every time there's rain. Uh, this can be a, 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 uh, an area of convergence, which Japan is helping us. Uh, the United States helps us too through the USAID, uh, however, I think there must be a value proposition on this. Uh, and the value proposition being that uh, the Philippines is open for business. It is an area for uh, uh, joint ventures, an area where we have the intellectual capability to partner with higher technology for uh, co-production or, or what have you. And uh, it is an area where if there are the right incentives, it can be a sustainable and reliable uh, supply chain and business partner. I mean, it's a logistical, uh, strategically located logistical hub that is underutilized and underdeveloped. Uh, uh, it's right, it straddles between the uh, Pacific and the South China Sea. A lot of data cables cross through there, which is why perhaps China has a keen interest on, on, on the Philippines, and uh, which is why we have to cooperate so that these uh, undersea and uh, uh, data fiber cables are not exploited and they do not come under the influence of the wrong hands. Uh, secondly, there is also a need to co-partner in critical infrastructure in the Philippines, uh, which is a target of uh, malign uh, interest by what have you. So uh, I think it is truly critical that since an investment in critical infrastructure, in connectivity, in productivity, for ex uh, I, uh, in the United States, for example, we have entered into a one, two, three partnership for the uh, exploration and development of nuclear energy. It is very difficult to have uh, sustainable renewables of the non-nuclear type in an archipelago of 7,000 plus islands. It, it doesn't work. And for a stable base load to be generated by renewables, the, the experience probably or the technology, uh, uh, call me a curmudgeon in this, it's not there yet in so far as I'm concerned because I was a business executive and you have to deal with the top line and the bottom line. So uh, uh, I think these are areas where uh, the value proposition between resilience and the business case converge. And it is one area where all of us can uh, converge in. I saw all the hands going up in the same row. I don't know, you're obviously sat in, the, in the, the right place. I saw the gentleman with the red tie first. Could you just please hand the microphone to him? Yeah, you've got the microphone, sir, I think. Oh, let, did, did you I've have- I've got one? a microphone, sorry. Okay, Rome, why don't you, while you've got yes. it, why don't you use it? 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm Ron Kallick, and I'm an expert associate at the National Security College at ANU. Uh, my questions are about grey zone. That uh, unusually, that word hasn't yet come up. I think, and I'm wondering um, to what extent, Secretary, uh, you feel that Philippines is on the cutting edge, really, on the on of. Uh, uh, new grey zone tactics that are being employed against you uh, in which uh, the, one of the tests is how far can one go without war being declared? And uh, that's a frightening thought, I know, but uh, this seems to be uh, a, a move that, uh, that uh, the PRC is uh, really under undertaking in a very concerted and thoughtful manner, uh, and it has re it has obviously uh, thoughts of undertaking those tactics in other places as well. So I'd be very keen to hear your view on whether you're on the front line against grey zone tactics. Yes, thank you very much. I, I think uh, we've seen grey zone tactics uh, multiply uh, exponentially during the past year. From, uh, from, of course, the use of uh, uh, maritime militia, uh, Coast Guard vessels, uh, no, actually battleships disguised as Coast Guard vessels, and uh, 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 under the guise of domestic law enforcement by China in an illegally claimed area. I think that's the most obvious uh, dem uh, use of a gray zone tactic which definitely, uh, and the question propounded to me is why we keep on protesting these things, why we keep on uh, accept, uh, be, being at the receiving end of these things. Uh, well, it so happens that we are at the receiving end of these things while we are conducting lawful activities in our waters and we cannot stop doing these things. On the other hand, we cannot stop protesting these things because we do not acquiesce into their illegal narratives. Now, we are very conscious of the fact that a, a false, a, a wrong move can lead to a disastrous war, which we want to avoid. But then again, avoidance of conflict at each and every twist and turn of the friction between China and us uh, for a defense secretary is tantamount to uh, uh, appeasement, which we cannot do. So there's a fine line between that. And we are very conscious of the fact that uh, uh, there is a possibility that false moves can create it, but what we want to uh, let our people understand and accept that we are in a struggle, and this struggle is a long-drawn process. Friction will occur. Activities will occur where there will be prob probably injuries, damage to property, and hopefully not loss of lives. It is, uh, it is part of the struggle which the armed forces of the Philippines and other law enforcement authorities must accept as part of their sworn duty. The risk is there. Now, our responsibility as uh, members of uh, government and as elected members to ensure that they are not exposed foolishly, foolishly to risks that are foolishly taken. That is on the external side. And the only way, perhaps, for us to deal with this is to have some deterrence capabilities and to beef up our own muscle uh, and have more robustness in our own uh, self-protection mechanisms. And, our, uh, and uh, of course, keeping a higher level of operational security also in our internal processes. Now, another uh, area is the domestic subversion by China, of which we have uh, uncovered several cyber criminal hubs, which I personally believe will not be operating without their knowledge or, uh, or what have you. Uh, we have uh, 
brought down uh, uh, these complexes uh, as far as we can see them because they hide under under uh, under several uh, disguises like real estate firms, law firms, uh, legitimate BPO uh, firms. Uh, and uh, these criminal syndicate hubs were uh, engaged in uh, illegal gambling, uh, drugs, money laundering, kidnapping, corruption of public officials. Uh, and these activities weakened the economic and the political and the social fabric of the Philippines. For example, one which we raided lately, it was an induction furnace. Uh, uh, one, I believe, of several which were donated for free by uh, Chin uh, uh, Chinese allied firms, uh, knowing fully well that the steel that these produce are substandard and uh, the process is dirty. And uh, this uh, phenomenon of several of these donated is the biggest stumbling, was the biggest stumbling block to a steel industry, a bona fide steel industry being formed in the Philippines, which also affects our defense modernization, particularly a joint venture which we have in Australia, because we need steel uh, hulls for our vessels. So uh, we also are uncovering, it's hard to do, because of very liberal immigration policies and laws, uh, false uh, people having false citizenships, and then they buy real estate, uh, strategically uh, located real estate, or they get married to a local, uh, and uh, the rest is, uh, you know, uh, history in so far as they're concerned. Uh, so it is a multi-pronged uh, attack by uh, uh, identified United Front work uh, uh, members in in our our media troll farms uh, smearing reputations of uh, uh, those that are vocal against China and spreading uh, for example the mindset that if we develop our own armed forces, we have deterrence capabilities, we become an inviting target for a first strike by China. Uh, this is the oft-repeated refrain of China. And everything they don't want, if you notice, their MOFA uh, spokesperson say that it will be uh, disruptive of regional peace and stability, but everything they do is okay. So, uh, Can I just ask yeah. a brief follow-up on that on the gray zone do you think that it may have served its purpose because there may be a downside to the concept of the gray zone because we always obsess about the threshold it puts risk in our mind uh, whereas the other side do not think about gray zone they think about a continuation a continuum of conflict yes and the conflict may have military elements or non-military elements, but it's a continuum nonetheless. And that puts us at a disadvantage uh, because often the, the, the instinctive result of, of policymakers who are politicians in de democratic countries is, is to urge de-escalation when in fact this, the pattern of behavior is deliberate escalation on the other side. I just wonder that whether gray zone may actually perversely deter us from taking necessary countermeasures. No, it does, and, it, and admittedly, we're at a disadvantage because, for example, uh, we, we, we can't just close down press establishments that uh, we suspect are publishing things that are uh, part of a UFW feed because we have freedom of the press values, and that's why the conflict is inherently unfair because China can take advantage of our liberties to attack us while we can't do the same in their own home country, right? So it is inherently unfair. However, if China is responsible, it would, uh, it would uh, 
shall I say, take a step back from what I saw uh, somebody uh, term as actuarial espionage by, by planting uh, students, people all over, by trying to disrupt a country in a macro basis because what it, what it will uh, lead to once uh, the networks are uncovered is there is a danger of, uh, of xenophobia uh, building in or a, a, a bigot, bigotry in a society which uh, they fair, they, they, uh, it, which they must accept the blame for because of what they're doing in exploiting uh, the, you know, a culture which welcomes visitors, a culture which is trusting and welcoming. And if uh, this, uh, this kind of environment is deliberately exploited, then it leads to, uh, I mean, racism in society, and that is a danger that they only have themselves to blame. I, I mean, you've had several prosecutions for uh, espionage uh, of uh, the United States too and other countries. We're, de we're, we're developing our own Corrupt Practices Act uh, or Illegal Interference Activities by Foreigners Act, and so we, we can deal with it. However, it is a reality, and I really, I really feel sometimes that it is much more challenging to combat because of the constraints that we have on us by our constitutions. Thank you. Um, we have time only for one very brief question. Uh, are there any female members of the audience who would like to ask a question who have not so far? No? Going once, twice? Andrew Feelings, my name. Uh, Rowan stole my uh, United Front question, so I'll ask another one. Um, Keep it brief, Andrew. Yeah, I was uh, in Manila when uh, President Duterte was um, elected. To what extent do you think that camp, as it were, perhaps represented by his daughter, um, is uh, in opposition, in conflict with the uh, current president and the federal policy with regard to China? A domestic politics question. Sort of, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think this is, uh, I, I'll keep my answer uh, to what empirical data, or hopefully empirical data shows. That 90 to 95 percent of the Filipinos do not trust China's intentions and they condemn China's moves. So and it is the responsibility of any politician uh, if uh, we follow the adage that we listen to our people and in this case, I think our people are right. It is the responsibility of any politician to listen to the people and to correct a wrong. Uh, I know that uh, I think there was an ultra-nationalistic bent in the past. However, uh, it's good if you had a counterparty who would exploit your ultra-nationalism or your nationalism in a manner which uh, in a good faith manner rather than to exploit this for its own selfish advantage, which China does, and it has proven itself to be unreliable as uh, uh, a, a, a country which cares about uh, equality and freedom in the world. It, it buttresses the argument made by several scholars that uh, China's narrative of being at the center of the world, a world uh, where smaller countries pay tribute to it, particularly in the Southeast Asian area, to be led by China. They're proving it uh, to be true by their own actions. And so Filipinos who fought against stronger, uh, at, at the time, uh, stronger odds against stronger odds will always resist this. There will be some who will be co-opted, but uh, I do not think uh, that these are in the majority as our people with their opinions show. Now, on, a, on an operational basis, I think 
there is some conflict of how we deal with this distrust in China, but 70% of the people are in favor of the Marcos administration approach to dealing with China. We're at the end of our hour now, um, sadly. I would like to thank our on online viewers, uh, those of you in the room, including those who have asked questions, apologies to those who had questions we couldn't get to in time. But most of all, I would like to uh, thank you, Secretary thank Teodoro, you, you. For, your, uh, um, for your confidence in being uh, agreeable to a, an in-conversation format. Uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't be too confident if this were in Beijing. <laughs> But I, I don't think we will be following you there if you go either. But, uh, but we do hope that you will con continue the conversation with Aspie in future, uh, either here again on a subsequent visit or when we visit uh, Manila in future. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, show your appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much.